Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. I'm in Toronto, but we're going to do a little bit of traveling today to visit some youthful uh, activists. In fact, the topic of our discussion today is about youthful activism. And I have three young people that I want to get to know here who've all been leaders in the in the projects that we need to have covered by either saving the world from nuclear war or from climate change or from both or maybe some other things. So today, um, Kekishan Basu is, is here in Toronto with me. Uh, she is the founder of an organization called Green Hope Foundation, which is about um, mostly about environmental and climate change issues. And she founded it when she was 12 years old. Uh, Andrew Kim is in um, uh, Pennsylvania uh, for the summer. He is normally, he is a, a student at Princeton University, History and American Studies. And uh, in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, we have Rebecca Wolf Gage. Uh, Rebecca uh, founded when she was age 12 in uh, 2018, she founded something called the Victoria Youth Climate Strike. This is part of the uh, large number of young people who were going on strike every Friday, I think you know, inspired by the young Swedish uh, girl. And, um, uh, and uh, at, um, one of the things that she has done <clears throat> is she and three other young people uh, took the federal government of Canada to court on the grounds that the decision that to buy the Trans, -Can Trans Mountain Pipeline affected um, and violated their rights, um, their future. Unfortunately, they lost the case, but I want to take opportunity to salute her for having the nerve to, to do such things. So hello, young people, and let's start with Kekashan. First of all, it's great to be here once again. And uh, yeah, you know, Green Hope Foundation, I founded it when I was 12. I had actually started my work five years prior to that when I was seven and really realized that, you know, there we as young people have a huge opportunity and a responsibility to bring about positive change as responsible denizens of our planet. And when I was 12, after I returned from being the youngest at the Rio Plus 20 conference, I realized that, you know, there is this huge gap where young people and specifically children are concerned in involving themselves in sustainable development. So Green Hope Foundation was founded to provide that platform of learning and action. And our Act, we kind of redefine what activism really means. You know, in general, youth are tokenized as just being strikers and protesters, but we use education for sustainable development as a transformative tool, working with our world's most vulnerable communities and ensuring that they are able to have the knowledge that in turn translates into action on the ground. And our work is on climate justice and on feminist climate justice, where we recognize the interconnections with gender equality, with peace and nuclear disarmament, with uh, good health and well-being, with this year's International Youth Day theme being on human and planetary well-being and sustainable food systems. We intersect that with our work on climate, as well as clean energy. So really just bringing together all of the sustainable development goals, all of our sustainability issues, and really recognizing that we need localized ground level actions to ensure climate justice and at the same time ensure justice for humanity and justice for the planet. So whether that's through installing solar panels or providing clean water and sanitation to providing education to girls, at the end of the day, our goal is to create a sustainable and peaceful world for all. Mm. Now, I believe Green Hope is pretty international. You are um you're kind of an international person anyway, right? You were born someplace in the Middle East or you were? Yeah, so I was born and uh, raised in Dubai and I do consider myself to be a global citizen and Green Hope Foundation does work in 25 countries. And that, and you, your previous question about like the pandemic, that was something that, you know, we were actually worried about at the beginning where it's like, how do we continue our work? But yeah, Green Hope Foundation's main mission is 
localized action that you know has now gone international. And also in my role as a UN human rights champion, that is something that is very important for uh, all of us. So yeah. Uh, but by the way, uh, Kekashan, you're you're also a student, aren't you? Yes, a- I'm a a- here at the University of Toronto, and I also just finished a course at Imperial College London on business strategy and consulting. So, oh my goodness, you're going to bring in the corporate world too. Good for you. <laughs> okay, Very that's harder. I, I I believe that may be a bit daunting, but good for you. All right, Andrew. Tell us about your, you were about to share with me a kind of epiphany that you had when you had a course at uh, Princeton last year. Um, Maybe a little background about myself. Certainly, I was born in the United States and then my family moved to Canada. And then oddly enough, my education brought me back to the United States where, as you mentioned, I studied at Princeton University. And this past summer, uh, well, more like in the spring, I suppose, I took a course um, taught by one of my professors at Princeton who sort of lamented the movement of graduates of Princeton University into the financial sector, into the computer science sector, and far less into the activism sector, into government. And so he sort of implored us to look for that as a potential avenue, as a career, as a potential career path. And certainly that's what I did this summer. I stepped my toes into the wonderful organization Reverse Trend, um, sponsored by the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation fiscally and coordinated by three wonderful coordinators, Christian Shabandu, Lovely Mayim, and Danielle Sandler. And the RTT is, it, it, it's a great organization. So what we do is we basically look to empower and educate youth in a very similar manner to uh, what Kekashan uh, discussed. We basically try to empower them through education. So we have an entire curriculum dedicated on the intersection of climate change and nuclear weapons. And we think that's incredibly important because it's a tool that we can use to empower youth, not just in you know, like the United States and Canada, but all around the world. Um, we've sort of started chapters in a variety of countries from Korea, Japan, France, the Pacific, even Canada as well, of course. And you know, we, a lot of those have met, uh, met great successes. And our most recent achievement, I believe, is um, holding a Francophone conference entirely in French and getting an ICANN series appeal uh, We've gotten Winnipeg to officially endorse the ICANN series appeal, the first of the Prairie Provinces. The, the ICANN, what are you talking about? The the ICANN series appeal. So it's a basically, so ICANN is the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And so they have basically developed a sort of campaign called the ICANN cities appeal. Basically, um, it's where people can take this ICANN cities appeal, which supports basically the treaty on uh, what's called non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. And basically you take that to your city, your city councilor, your mayor, whoever it may be, you get the city to endorse that. And the hope is by getting enough cities in a nation to endorse this city's appeal, the nation itself will then sign into the TPNW. So that's sort of like the larger goal. And we're incredibly proud that we've gotten Winnipeg to hop in. It's the first city in all the Prairie Provinces to get in, and we're hoping to spread that success even further in Canada. What does the appeal ask? To put it shortly, the outcome is sort of that the city councillors sort of agree and would publicly endorse um, on behalf of the city that basically um, the TPNW, which basically states that nuclear weapons should be completely prohibited and completely eliminated. And those are the two sort of basic clauses um, to endorse that appeal, spread it all over the nation, and then eventually get the nation to support the TBNW. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. All right, Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, we've interacted in the past. You were on the cover of Peace Magazine, which I uh, edit uh, because I saw you with this wonderful megaphone or bullhorn or whatever you out there leading a a demonstration. That would have been a couple of years ago though, when you were 13, right? Uh Uh-huh, all right. Tell me what what was uh, all that about? You were organizing a demonstration in was it Fridays for the Future? We call it um, climate strike and uh, climate strike. Um, we don't necessarily use the Fridays for Future thing, but it's definitely in the same movement. Um, and we were, I think, organizing our September twenty seventh uh, strike, which was the biggest climate strike we've ever had uh, in Victoria, which got out twenty thousand people. So we we're really excited about that. Hmm. Okay, that's what you did then. Now, what do you? What happened all these uh, all these many months since we've been in lockdown and other constraints? 
Uh, how much of a dent did this make in in the work that young people have been able to do? We can't meet in person anymore. Uh, we've only actually had one strike since the um, pandemic started, and it wasn't. Uh, we we could have done a lot more to uh, try to promote it more, but it definitely wasn't the biggest strike uh, we've had. Um, so I think, yeah, just it keeps everyone separate and it doesn't let us go to big events. But luckily, um, now that things are starting to open up again, we're finally able to you know, organize events that are in person um, and take that step to uh, go back to our normal climate strikes. Mm -hmm. How did you organize it in the first place? Because you were in school, I suppose you really had access to you could talk to, and get other people to talk to each other, right? It must be harder if you have to actually make a phone call. When I first started organizing with climate strikes, I didn't really think that anyone cared uh, my generation. So um, I thought that I would be the only one at the legislature. Um, and I, so I wrote to the media and thought, well, at least, at least this will get um, media to come and, you know, make make it known that some youth care about the environment um and that actually led to uh, getting other youth out um so i think using social media using media um putting up posters in different schools um just things that everyone can see um definitely mm -hmm. makes an impact and it's i think become somewhat of a trend now to go to climate strike so that's definitely helping mm -hmm. okay did you have a lot of opposition uh, did, were people very critical of the fact that you were taking off from school in order to go march around the city? Uh, at the beginning, um, I wrote to a few. I wrote to all the MLAs, inviting them to my first climate strike. And I had some um, MLAs that definitely were um, thought really critically of my movement um, and Greta Thunberg's movement to... Um, you know, start, try to save our futures. But generally, um, in my school, my teachers are very supportive. Um, and we always have, you know, I heart fossil fuel um, t-shirt wearers who come to our strikes and uh, try an anti-movement. But um, for the most part, everyone's really supportive. But is there anything that you can call a transnational youth uh, movement of people who Try, I know that Kekashan is in a way international. I can speak for Green Hope when I said like, you know, we work on nuclear disarmament and there I was actually, I think Andrew, it's awesome that more young people are getting involved in the disarmament movement. And one of our main areas of work is to is disarmament education as part of education for sustainable development and ensuring that uh, even in nations that, that haven't yet signed on to the TPNW, ensuring that at least their young people and children are educated about why nuclear disarmament is so important, how that relates to all of these other issues of gender uh, inequality and racial inequality, indigenous rights and climate change, of course, and then ensuring that, you know, they at least have the skills and knowledge that when they grow up and are able to come into positions of power, they don't make the same mistakes that their predecessors made. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of intersections with the different youth movements around the world. Uh, I think that, you know, young people, I mean, we're not a homogenous group. We have different needs, wants, addressing different issues. But at the same time, you know, there are definitely intersections, both, you know, locally, nas nationally, regionally, and internationally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Andrew? Of course, if I can add, like, absolutely, Kakashan, which is a wonderful point. There's an incredible number of intersections. And RTT, of course, is not just about nuclear disarmament. I think we talk about it um, on a variety of events and our webpage and stuff like that. We are heavily invested into all sorts of issues, although we mainly focus on nuclear disarmament, of course, climate change, indigenous land rights, and so much more race relations, etc. They all come into play in this incredibly interconnected field. And one might even note that, like, you know, there's no like global sort of like connection. Like obviously not all organizations can be globally connected. There's too many, you know, like barriers for that to happen from time zones to languages to so on and so forth. But certainly there's a lot of partners that we have and that we have experience working with. Climate Cardinals, for example, um, the, the one of the youth-led organizations working on climate justice is actually one of our partners. And we're, we've been incredibly excited to work with them. 
um, on a number of occasions for a variety of Say events. Say it again. Who, cl climate Partners? Is climate it? Cardinals. Um, climate. They are, yes, Climate Cardinals. They're a uh, relatively recently developed youth group. Um, I think it was founded by youth, and it's an international youth-led nonprofit, basically, that's basically looking to make um, the climate group, the climate movement, ex excuse me, more accessible to folks who sort of don't speak English. You, you've you been working this summer as kind of an intern or something. Is that it? Um, it it's my, my internship has been so far, it's been great. I've been able to meet a lot of people, incredible colleagues and folks from all around the world, to be honest. And, you know, a lot of my work is based in the United States and Canada um, and a little bit of, um, of stuff in Korea because I'm able to speak and write a little bit of Korean so I can sort of understand um, the languages there and sort of look to make an entry in, into, into that front. But so far, a lot of the stuff that we've been doing in terms of like reverse of trans internships has been how do we empower and galvanize youth, especially as we discussed earlier in an age where we're just coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and during a time, especially where so many groups have been essentially working from remote so long. How do we now bring it back? How do we bring youth activism back? It, at the same time, it's incredible because it's opened up an avenue that hasn't really existed before, an avenue of galvanizing youth through social media and getting them to attend conferences through Zoom, through online platforms, not just in you know, a local area, but nationwide conferences, nationwide movements, those kinds of avenues. Previously, we haven't explored them that much. Certainly we've had like international or national days, for example, like Earth Day or like where days where we were set to, you know, march or do, you know, do a protest or something like that. But now we have something that's more almost concrete, like, right? You can't have like a national conference, something before the COVID-19 pandemic you couldn't have a national conference on nuclear disarmament without bringing everyone to one place, which would take time, resources, et cetera, et cetera, for everyone who wanted to attend, right? But now with online platforms and stuff like that, we find it, it's interesting because we can reach out to so many youth and we've been able to see how many youth we can attract through online marketing. Not, I wouldn't call it marketing. I would call it galvanizing, to be honest. At the computer on very social media or email or what often it's sort of like that to be honest we you reach out to organizations through email you talk to youth through you know conferences like sort of you through zoom platforms etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's a lot of computer networking now in a world where you don't have to be at a certain location to meet someone in order to persuade them to join a movement it's a world where now you can speak to them wherever you are in the world and you can hopefully bring them to action so you're speaking to people in South Korea too? Um, I've been speaking to a few. However, it's difficult for us to really get there considering we've only been able to start that particular initiative recently. Our foray into Korea has been a little more limited. Let's put it like that. Um, but we've had larger successes in the United States and Canada. I'd be interested in, in knowing the general, whether you can observe, and maybe Kekashan has some impression too, uh, whether or not you knowing different parts of the world, different countries a little bit, whether you can see any difference in the general opinion, public opinion, or the, the, the outlook of youth in, in different countries. For example, when you say South Korea, I'm thinking, okay, I think probably the South Koreans are, have been very concerned about trying to keep from exacerbating the problem their tensions with North Korea, which may mean that they are more um, <clears throat> cautious and uh, about, uh, you know, not being careful not to use inflammatory language, not, not to be too provocative, et cetera, more, um, you know, deliberate and cautious. And I'm only guessing because nobody ever t told me that before. But would you say there's anything to that? Um, I'd say there are relatively mixed opinions, but for the most part, they're certainly like what you say. They try not to use the inflammatory language and it's best for them to, they, they at least would, for generally, perhaps they might believe that it's best not to rattle the cage too much, so to speak. It's mm -hmm. an interesting thing because there's a wide divide between um, older Koreans and younger Koreans on the topic of nuclear weapons. 
Um, there's a very interesting story behind that because oh, please tell me. <laughs> of course, of course. I'm not aware of the different age differential there on that. Well, so um, it's so it, a friend basically explained the situation sort of it like uh, sort of like this. Older Koreans basically would sort of support um, nuclear weapons and to some extent North Korea's right to nuclear weapons because to some extent they um, support reunification and it's very difficult for North Korea and South Korea to sort of have that sort of stage to talk about reunification when North Korea doesn't have a place on the world stage. And so to that extent, in order to gain that leverage, older South Koreans sort of support the North Koreans' right to nuclear weapons, however disturbing that may be. And that's a very interesting sort of dynamic considering the histories of these two countries. Whereas younger Koreans are to some extent more conservative. They uh, they sort of see the two nations as very separate and they've been brought up in a world where these two are, com- are in completely different fields. One is, you know, led by an authoritarian regime. The other one is a democracy. One is backed by the United States. The other is very anti-United States. And so the differing cultures and impressions and stances of these two countries hold very different meanings for young Koreans and old Koreans, which is why young Koreans tend to be more conservative about the issue And as mentioned before, they don't really like to rattle the cage that much. It's, of course, very different. Of course, you can generalize that to any country, regardless of what country you go to, their cultures and their practices and their foreign relations will certainly shape a different dynamic to their thoughts on what nuclear weapons um, and, you know, expanded issues such as climate change and so on and so forth should be. um, Tekashan, if you'd like to also add your impressions as well. Yeah, for sure. I think like on a lot of, and uh, South Korea is actually one of the places where we have interacted with uh, people of all ages in our peace movements. And you are right that there is a mixed opinion. And in a lot of countries, I think that's there. And uh, one of the main issues, uh, one of the main reasons why we've seen that is because a lot of people, and that includes young people, aren't exactly aware about what the nuclear disarmament movement entails, or even like the, what, threats nuclear weapons pose because Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened 76 years ago and a lot of the times even for young people that just seems as it happened so long ago what relevance does it have now and that is something that the nuclear club of nations actually exploits to uh, put forth this false sense of security where it's nuclear weapons are seen as a source of national pride and it is really sad to see some young people even adhering to that and that's what we work to dismantle at Green Hope Foundation and just to speak about how important it is to look at different perspectives and different ways of approaching issues. I mentioned earlier that Green Hope Foundation works in some of the most vulnerable communities of our world and you can see in my background this is in the Syrian a refugee camp on the Lebanon-Syria border. This is in an orphanage in Suriname. This is in uh, a home for HIV positive children in Nepal. And all of these communities are usually left behind and forgotten in the discussions on whether it's nuclear disarmament or climate change or equality. And, you know, in a lot of these conservative societies, it's really important for us to approach with caution as well, because we can't just go in and tell them that this is what you need to do, because that's not going to work. And specifically, if we are to provide that sense of self-empowerment to the women and children, uh, particularly, we have to be really, really careful. So it requires slow uh, action sometimes, like gradual movements towards you know, bringing about the change and a lot of patience. And I think even in the climate movement, and I speak about feminist climate justice at the grassroots, that is something that is really, really important. And, you know, it's, it takes time, but if we are patient and if we ensure that we don't give up, then, you know, we can uh, achieve progress. And we've seen that we just installed Last week and this week, two mobile libraries in India and Bangladesh in the villages there. And, you know, in those are really, really conservative villages. To, so to get the elders and the male elders of the village to agree to something like that, it was a long process, but eventually it came about because the benefits of having an educated uh, community of women and young people were clearly seen. And now, since the girls especially have dropped out of school and haven't gone to school in a year and a half, we're bringing the books and the library to them. And that is actually powered by solar energy. So it's climate smart and gender smart. So 
for us, it's just, re again, recognizing those intersections, recognizing those unique local challenges, and not just going right in, but approaching with uh, the necessary caution so that everyone benefits at the end of the day. Do you find that young people are more likely to, uh, to be influenced by and, and open to your arguments than they would if, let's say, I came out and gave a talk? or somebody my generation, uh, does, it, does it help if, I, I guess I have the impression that young people um, are experimenting with autonomy as, as they should be and wanting more to do things on their own than to be simply uh, in, recruited into uh, peace organizations run by old people. Uh, am, I, am I right or not? You know, Green Hope Foundation works on intergenerational solidarity. So we're all about bringing in everyone's perspectives. I definitely uh, see, you know, the benefits of children talking to other children. That's something that is front and center in our sustainability academies that we have, which are our education conferences that are le led and organized by children for children. And, you know, it's amazing to see how beneficial peer to peer communication is. But at the same time, like I said, we work on intergenerational solidarity. So getting the wisdom of our elders, of those who have uh, approached things in a different way, and not necessarily in a bad way, but just different way, because obviously you're, you know, from a different generation and their needs and wants at that time were slightly different. So really bringing in those perspectives and seeing where everyone is coming from. And even if you're not, you know, agreeing, it just acknowledging that people's feelings and wants and needs are valid. So, you know, that is what we work towards. And especially we as young people, I think COVID has shown us how important it is to come together and not just like, you know, play the blame game and blame adults and governments and private sector, but really recognize that people have different opinions, people, and if we are to bring about positive change, it's important to hear that out, see where they're coming from, and then see how best we can address uh, those connections and move towards a sustainable world. And you mentioned earlier that I'd have to work with corporates with my course in business strategy and consulting. That is something Green Hope does. We work with adults, we work with government institutions, we work with the private sector as well, and just see how we can bridge the gap that currently exists amongst the government, the private sector and civil society. And we've seen a lot of uh, benefit in that for both at the highest levels of policy making as well as at the ground level. The reason I asked this question, I um, created a program in peace and conflict studies at the campus of the University of Toronto, where I taught for about 30 years. And um, I ran it for 15 years or so until I retired, which was well over 20 years ago. I can't, lost track now. Uh, <clears throat> so I taught uh, you know, probably 1,000 students uh, in uh, some of these courses and in the program. I'd have about 20 to 30 students a year getting a, 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 back, a BA in peace studies, uh, but nobody ever became a peace activist. Uh, now that really is what bothered me, but when, when there was an event that got students agitated, for example, I'm thinking of the first Iraq war there was a big dramatic moment when these planes took off and started bombing Baghdad and, and it was, you know, be big on CNN and so on. <clears throat> and the students, by and large, really opposed this war. So they organized an opposition to it. They would use, I had a, a peace resource center with all kinds of documentation that I was collecting and so on, which nobody ever used, but there you go. And um, they, they would come down and have their meetings, 15, 20 young people crammed into this center planning the events that they were gonna hold, rallies and so on at the college. And I thought this is wonderful because this shit is theirs. I, I wasn't even, you know, I didn't have to do anything to help promote it except open my office door and and uh, and it took off it was always fine so long it was theirs and uh so i had the feeling i re reached the conclusion that really 
youth organizations have to be owned and managed by youth. And that um, we, uh, every peace group that I've ever belonged to spends a lot of time talking about how we have to recruit youth. And I think I keep telling them, forget it. That's youth don't want to join us. That's their own business. They will do what they want to do when they're ready for it. But uh, they don't necessarily want to become um, appendages to uh, an organization already that's existed 30 years and run by old people. Um, but um, and, and so I think the place where old people should be recruiting new members is from other people who are becoming old people, you know, at age 65, it's a great time to recruit somebody because they've got free time now that they're retiring and they have, they're pretty familiar with the issues and so on. And, uh, you know, I expect you guys to organize the youth and I think you're doing it, right? Or am I really off base? I can Rebecca, get- you're, you're the youngest of the lot. So let, I want your opinion about that first, because to what extent do you think it's really important that it's you out there with that megaphone and not me? I mean, just, um, I guess in the sense of, I think you're right about um, when, you, when you have a group of youth that isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily know about issues and um, isn't necessarily motivated to come to uh, strikes or come to events or take action. Um, they don't want to hear it from older people. They definitely want to hear it from, you know, their friends and their peers and people that they hang out with regularly because those people, they're not, they don't necessarily see as activists. Um, they can see as just like people that they see on a regular basis. Um, and if those, if they're friends who aren't necessarily into environmental activism or whatnot, um, are starting to take action and that opens, you know, a door where they can say, why are they doing this? Should I be involved in this as well? Uh, I think even from uh, youth who are activists, um, there's still um, something where um, there's definitely like, I guess, an inter- intergenerational uh, gap, um, as you've mentioned a bit, um, where uh, youth trust other youth, I guess, a bit more than um, they would adults in the sense that, um, they can, um, and I guess, understand the information that they're giving to them. I think it's like a cool event, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay, I interrupted you, Kekshan. Of course. Uh, yeah, I, as I said, I do definitely see the benefit of peer-to-peer engagement. And, you know, that has been so amazing for our youngest members. But at the same time, I, I think any person, regardless of age, if you want to bring about change you're going to find the inspiration wherever no matter like how old the person is like you're looking to for inspiration and you know I have been such a strong proponent of intergenerational solidarity and working together because my inspiration came from my parents and my grandmother and you know because I used to accompany my parents when they used to go out every weekend to distribute food and clothes to the, uh, the less fortunate. My grandmother to this day has an organic terrace garden that, you know, has inspired our current Grow Your Own Food campaign led by our children's board. So, you know, for me, I found inspiration there and was able to then turn that inspiration into actions on the ground and something and with Green Hope Foundation. So really, I think that I think allyship is really important uh, in this day and age, and that really spans across all of the movements that are currently ongoing, whether it's, you know, women's rights or LGBTQ plus rights or racial equality. And I think just understanding that people have different perspectives and going from there, instead of telling someone exactly what to do, putting forth the knowledge and then allowing them to be able to take their action in the way that they would see uh, that that best fits what they want uh, to do and what change they think that they can bring about. And that definitely applies to uh, the intergenerational work as well. And just to say that, you know, uh, even you, Meta, I see you as an inspiration because I remember attending one of your talks like many years ago before I uh, joined U of T. And I saw you as a huge inspiration for someone who has dedicated her whole life to peace and disarmament and making the world a better place. So yeah, I think we can find inspiration everywhere. Thank you. That's sweet. I, I wish I could say, yes, I remember you were in the third row, weren't you? 
<laughs> I can't remember it, but I'm glad that you do. That's that's great. Okay. Now, uh, um, Andrew, you know, you want to chime in on this, and I have another question. Yeah. Sure. Um, let me chime on this first because the interesting thing about this, at least for my organization, reverse the trend, it's almost entirely youth led, and that adds a very interesting dynamic to it because. Let, oh, I'm going to use Canada as an example. Um, for Canada, the coordinators of RTT Canada are me, a high school student um, who is now going into university, Avinash Paul Singh, and a high school student who is, I think, going into grade 10, uh, Rujali. And the, I think the fact that we're youth brings a very different dynamic to the table because youth, on, on one hand, I am very supportive of intergenerational solidarity. And on the other hand, I have found, at least to my experience, that youth have the strongest voices often um, in these kinds of scenarios. Why, why is that? And I thought long and hard about it. And often I find is that the reason is that youth are the people who have the most at stake to some extent. And so their voices, at least to me, resonate so much louder um, because I know that these youth are, are activists right now because they don't want to see this trend in, in their future world. They don't want to grow up in that kind of world. And that's the entire reason sort of behind our name. It's to reverse the trend, quite literally. And so I find that being in a completely youth-led dynamic changes a variety of things. Certainly we partner with organizations and certainly that's, we don't, of course, we don't exclude, you know, people based on their generation or anything like that. Certainly not because movements like these often need all the support they can get. It's just that often youth are often labeled as a separate category, right? In many organizations, people have youth divisions or youth programs. And the reason for that is because youth often have their own dynamism to some extent. They galvanize people in a way that many others can't, especially during activism. And, you know, part of that leads youth to become empowered. You talked about agitation. Youth are agitated every day about a variety of issues. That's why they become activists. And, you know, they empower themselves through a variety of ways as a result. And sometimes those opportunities are given to them by adults. For example, in Canada, right, we have the recent Environment and Climate Change Youth Council that was established by the honorary um, Jonathan Wilkinson, who is the Minister for Environment and Climate Change. But often other times, right, youth really sort of try to bring out their own movements, just like how Pakistan and Rebecca have. And so that's, I think, what makes this intergenerational um, aspect such an interesting question. Um, and it's, it's fascinating to, to, um, to examine, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change that, you know, things need to be changed and that's why we're standing up for it. Yeah, really important to have intergenerational, um, you know, relationships. Uh, we've organized, actually the biggest strike we organized was uh, we took the lead on it, but um, we had adults organizing um, part of this with us and we got 20,000 people out. But I think it's definitely important for youth to take a lead role because, you know, for the um, the panel on environment, you know, that's not, that's not youth, that's 18 uh, plus. So I think um, youth have to have a role well, so all youth can, you know, take a stand and not just adult youth um is mm -hmm. normally when um you know adults are organizing things the first youth they think of that will actually want to do things are adults and um sometimes uh, i feel like youth who are um under the age of 18 and 19 um, by the majority age in the province um are thought of as um i guess less knowledgeable and um, less able to make decisions themselves. And I think that's part of the reason why we really need to have youth organizations um, that can work alongside uh, adult organizations as well, just because you know, we need to show that we actually can have our own voice. I'm, I'm saying, speaking for old people now, uh, a lot of us uh, feel impressed and vitalized by seeing uh, youth who are really tough. Now, the fact that, for example, Greta Thunberg uh, talks like, uh, oh, my goodness, I mean, she stands up to these guys and says, you're not doing it right. You shape up, you know, they're, you're not fair to us. You're ruining our, life. you know, there's, there's, she, if she's invited to the White House or to number 10 Downing or someplace and, and it, it gets to meet the head of government, instead of, you know, uh, seem simpering and, and looking polite and, and uh, gentle, uh, 
uh, and feminine. <laughs> she looks like a tiger, you know. Um, and and the rest of us who probably wouldn't do that. Uh, I think some of us are just wowed by it. Now, would you say that in general, young people are angrier about being, well, I mean, the argument is you're ruining our lives and we're the ones who are gonna suffer from these stupid policies that your government is pursuing. So, you know, be fair to us and let us live. That kind of argument is, um, we hear it. Now, is it really a prevailing argument? Do young people feel angrier, you think, about the your future than uh, we old folks um, do or not? I mean, I think in, in different senses, um, yes and no. Um, youth, I know personally, I've had a lot of environmental depression, and I've had to see counselors about it. Um, because, you know, I've I fear for my future. So that, I guess, turns into anger for many youth as well. Um, but, you know, my grandmother is getting arrested, um, stopping logging, and she's uh, taking so many actions because she cares for my future as well um, and for the future of future generations. So I think, um, yes, we care for our future a lot, but that doesn't mean that, you know, older people can't care for our future um, to the, potentially even the extent that we do. I think we will have to live through it, but Older, older people know that we'll have to live through it. So I think that we might be <laughs> angrier, as you say, but um, they can also be um, angry as well. Well, do you think you feel free to just talk back to these, uh, uh, you know, these conservative politicians who want to go ahead and put in pipelines and things? Um, I think, yeah, it's important to talk back to people, but I also think that it's important to hear where they're coming from um, so you can make an educated decision and so you can talk back, but with um, with information that might change their mind. You know, I, I, I totally do not want pipelines, but I also want to find a way so those workers can have um, money and can feed their families. So we have to talk about, you know, changing to a in green industry and um, make, bringing in education so these workers can go into the solar panel industry or the electrical industry. Um, because we, we can't have climate justice unless we bring everyone along. Beautiful. I love that. Okay, guys. Kekushan and Andrew, do you, uh, how do you see this? This toughness of youth or Am I misreading it altogether? No, I definitely do agree that every single person is a lot of people around the world are rightfully uh, angry at the fact that, you know, there hasn't been enough done. And I don't think that has anything to do with age because, you know, it's not like your life becomes invalid just because you're not a young person anymore. You still have a lot of years left to live. Uh, so, you know, it's just people seeing what the problems are and specifically the intersections with the already existing problems that climate change is just exacerbated. So I definitely think that people, regardless of their age, want to bring about change. But, you know, with Green Hope Foundation, like our base is, like I said, education for sustainable development, but our base comes from hope and, you know, working towards a brighter, better future and also realizing that the results, the, uh, the results of the actions that we take today might not, you know, be right in front of us at right this second. It might happen, you know, seven generations later, but at least it will benefit someone. So like for us, that is the way we uh, work and we work like this across like all generations and all sectors. Uh, but yeah, we are definitely huge supporters of just transition and really just ensuring that every single person is able to uh, bring about uh, positive change, regardless of age or any other social determinant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I absolutely agree with those points. I would only add um, that Youth today, at least, and uh, this must be true for most youth in the past as well, they feel like they're coming into a world burdened with problems that are very different from one that from ones that others have had to face in the past, because at present they face an unprecedented, uh, an unprecedented number of global potential catastrophes from climate change, nuclear weapons, the rise of artificial intelligence that some would argue poses a threat. And these factors make it very 
very challenging for them to think about the future, especially when you get into micromanners, for example, like how do you deal with the current housing market, for example, is a current question that many soon to be graduates have on their mind. And those kinds of questions are ones that are many that youth in the past have looked to look to try and, you know, deal with, but mostly they've dealt with micro matters. They haven't really faced macro matters such as how do we deal with the potential existential threat that youth today have to deal with. And certainly I wouldn't say that old people, um, I shouldn't say old people, I should say senior people. Um, no, that old, fine. I'm, that, I'm going to be 90 soon and you can feel very free to call me nine, uh, old. <laughs> Well, of older folks, at least, um, they don't perhaps like they can certainly be angry about the issue. And certainly they um, will have a role to play in activism because we need every person, as I mentioned before, to play a role, to play their part, to help, you know, uh, make this change. But at the same time, I think in the future, at least, I believe that today's youth and the youth of the future will be the key to driving this movement forward. Because at now, now, many youth, at least I would say, now see it as a battle how do we save not just you know how do we save the world quite literally when we're young we're told be ambitious you should you know like we adore superheroes and stuff like that now we are actually on a war path in which we are in a battle to truly save the world and for for from that perspective i think it it builds an urgency more so than anger it makes this you know there is a clock that is ticking and youth today are incredibly aware of it. And I think that's what per- perhaps shapes the perception that youth are angry. I don't think they're necessarily angry at previous generations or at their current situation. I think they're trying to move with urgency and trying to fix what they perceive to be a broken situation. And that sort of builds this perception that they're angry. You know, this is called Project Save the World that we're doing right now. And uh, so when I use that, people not only laugh at me, but they they correct me and they scold me and they, uh, reproach me for sounding arrogant and you know but i say we do have to save the world we have to save it from at least six global threats and and so we've chosen six threats that are all uh, impending disasters that could within a short period of time wipe out a billion people or so you know war and weapons especially nuclear uh, global warming famine pandemics we didn't even people laughed at us for even including pandemics but then Along came COVID uh, and uh, radioactive contamination, and then now cyber risks. And all of those, I see them as causally linked. And I see it as something that we need to approach as a single sort of unified package that all of these things, none of them can be solved without paying some attention to solving at least one of the others collectively. And I see that that at least uh, Andrew and Kakashan are addressing both climate and nuclear uh, threats, right? Warfare and so on. Uh, I don't know whether that's true for Rebecca. I would say, to, I, I would say that we're definitely less aware than we should be. Um, I'm involved in the club in my school, which is Escape, where we focus on both environmental and peace related issues. Um, so I am personally, I'm slightly, uh, slightly more aware than I think many of my colleagues are, but definitely we we um, we fight a lot with burnout um, and we definitely have like a lot of run in our organization. We definitely can't, we, we need to choose our battles and we need to know that other people, you know, can fight um, in other issues as well. And I think that's definitely something we should educate ourselves on more inside of our organization. And I would love to work with organizations um, later on that focus on um, issues like um, peace and nuclear wars. Um, but that's not necessarily something that our organization focuses on today. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, um, Kakashan and, and Andrew, uh, do you um, do you imagine that the youth movement of today can um, do a better job than I have been able to do in showing the, the linkage causally between uh, climate change and I think especially climate change and and uh, nuclear weapons and, and war in general, militarism. Um, I think that, that that we really can't solve either one of them without addressing some of the other uh, elements. And um, but I don't, I can't make that very obvious to people. I don't think many of the groups that I've been in 
have been able to <clears throat> make a convincing case that uh, these two issues have to be addressed um, together. Uh, what do you think about your movements? I think that like the young generation, if we are able to work with those who dedicated their lives to nuclear disarmament as well as uh, and nuclear justice, as well as climate justice and working with us and really bringing forth that collective wisdom and knowledge, I think we can definitely together do a good job or even a great job of ensuring a total nuclear disarmament. Uh, and, you know, one of the, I think young people of all generations, like when every generation was young, they have been the harbingers of change. And I definitely feel that this generation is no different because we can, uh, we definitely have the power to bring about change. And, you know, one of the things which I found really cool is a former Canadian Senator, uh, Senator Douglas Roche. Uh, he's a regular speaker at one of our panels and webinars. And he said that when my generation, like when we were uh, young people, we brought you the United Nations. And that is a huge accomplishment. I think that is amazing. And, you know, United Nations was a comp uh, like put in place to prevent nuclear war from ever happening again. So, you know, I think that uh, this generation dealing with a new set of problems that is kind of evolved from the problems of the past, I think we have a very good chance of moving forward. And that is something that, you know, we at Green Hope Foundation are uh, striving for, uh, for because we are bringing about this culture of peace and happiness instead and moving away from a culture of negativity and war and just really looking forward to a brighter future where every single person is able to have a life of dignity. And that's, you know, that's continues with our birthday, which is tomorrow at uh, International Youth Day. Great. Okay. Well, I love the, the idea and I would like to sort of express solidarity, you know, like instead of recruiting you to my group, I hope my group does what we can to support your group because you're the future. And, and um, already we see that in some of the work that you do. I mean, Andrew's uh, uh, organization, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation sponsors the, uh, the work that they're doing to promote ICANN's uh, changes, you know, the, the uh, uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons. It's, it's a, a terrific project. And, and that was started by young people. It's relatively young. It's relatively young, I believe. Mm -hmm. That treaty is, is really wonderful. So if we can um, kind of link up and, and uh, make it clear that, that you're doing that is really very supportive of the work, especially of transferring funds, because of the military budget is so, if only that, if we only make the point again and again and again that these weapons and these armies cost money and that money need, is needed for the very strong efforts that I think need to be made to reduce climate change or control it. And, and that, that transfer of funds from, um, from destructive uh, projects, although I, I, I mean, you know, Rebecca had, has just made a point. If, if we shut down the military, there are going to be jobs lost. There are going to be all kinds of ways in which people can will have to adjust and make some sacrifices. And we want to minimize the pain for everybody. So you have to listen to, to uh, everybody who's got a stake in, in the current uh, setup in order to, to make the kind of changes we need. But I think we have to, I, I would just encourage it. We don't have to do anything. You can do what you please. But I, I want to invite uh, young people as much as possible to, to as, as I do constantly with older people, to see uh, the linkage among some of these uh, projects that have to be addressed. So here I've made my speech. <laughs> who, who would like I, to find this up? <laughs> I would maybe like to maybe like maybe make one point about the interconnectedness because it's such an interesting point. RTT works with, again, both climate change and nuclear weapons. And, you know, their linkage is very, very linked, deeper than most people would realize because, of course, everybody knows the environmental potential impact of nuclear waste. But not only that, right, in, in a world of climate change, as resources become scarcer, 
the probability of war can only become higher and higher. And who's to say that those with nuclear weapons would not use them potentially on each other? And it's something, you know, like, you sometimes have to look deep for these linkages. And of course, like, just with the issue of resource shortage, you already can, like, look at the linkages to famine and, you know, like, to pandemics with material, uh, with uh, PPE, for example. And those kinds of linkages make it very, I think, difficult for one to affect to for one organization to really tackle everything but with various organizations working in tandem to tackle separate aspects while keeping in mind the the fact that these linkages exist i am at least optimistic that maybe one day one day you know these issues will not be the ones that we'll face of course the world will always be facing issues of some sort of some kind but at least i can be positive and hopeful that someday those will, uh, that these particular ones will be resolved well, I can not only be positive, but uh, enthusiastic because I'm inspired by you folks. Kekashan, I interrupted you. Sorry, it's, it's fine. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, $1.9 trillion were spent on, well, military budgets in 2019. And Costa Rica actually brought this up at their General Assembly speech. And I think that, you know, if we're talking about a just transition, sure, that, you know, it, it, it is a gradual process, but with nuclear weapons, that is something that, you know, we can redirect the money towards uh, addressing all of our, our world challenges. That is not going to be a hardship. What it does require is, you know, people in the uh, love powers that be that actually want to bring about change. There are many, but there's still, it's important that the nuclear club of nations really adheres to that. And, you know, also just to say that, uh, like it's not just nuclear weapons, it's the whole process of uh, like from cradle to grave nuclear weapons, like perpetrate injustice because the uranium mining happens in indigenous lands, even like fat men and little boy that were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the uranium mining happened in the Satudene First Nations in Canada. And that caused untold number of deaths of the men who carried the uranium, the radioactive ores in their bare hands. And people don't even know about that. And, you know, it's really important that when we're talking, that's where the interconnection also comes in. And these are the communities also most impacted by climate change. So I think that by dismantling the nuclear weapons and just taking that, the money that is spent on that and building more nuclear weapons to uh, other uh, problems, I think uh, that is really important. Like UK just announced a few months ago that it would expand its nuclear arsenal by 40%. Now that is a complete waste. You could have, they could have directed that money towards so many other issues, forget international, even nationally addressing uh, racial inequality, for instance. So, you know, it's just something that can be done. And it is our hope that I think young people and working with everyone else can definitely drive that change. All right, you've given me great hope. And thank you very much for this. Um, so thank you all and uh, carry on. All right, bye. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you for today. Bye.